and we're live. All right. Hello, folks. Thank you. Welcome back to House Education here Friday afternoon, January 26th. The room might look kind of sparse, but we have a couple folks who had to get on the road given long commutes and the road conditions and a couple of people who are in the really important maybe final meeting of the school construction task force. So uh, they will catch up with the testimony later as need be. So thank you so much for being here. We know you are very busy as well. Do you have an order you want to go in? You're going to uh, to start us off, Sherry? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. So good afternoon, Chairman Conlin, Vice Chair Brady, and members of the House Committee on Education. Thank you for inviting me and my colleagues to provide testimony on H630, legislation to create regional boards of cooperative education services. I am Sherry Souza, Mountain View Supervisory Union Superintendent, and I'm joined by Stephanie Batid Hancock, Director of Student Support Services for Wyndham Central Supervisory Union, and Andy Haas, Superintendent of Schools, Wyndham Northeast Supervisory Union. In addition, Kim Oliveira, uh, Vermont Collaborative Executive Director, is here to, to address any additional questions. Is, is it okay if I... Sorry, can I share my screen? Or is it up now? Is it up? It disappeared from Thursday. <laughs> it's not Friday. We're just having a short technical issue. Give us 30 seconds. Um, oh, we're up. We're it's not Friday. Friday. Okay. Yeah, just refresh. Yeah, just start. Thank you. Keep going. Thanks. Sorry, Sherry. No problem. I'm just maneuvering my Zoom as well. So hang on one second. There we go. And share. And Great share. Oops, I'm sorry. Wrong way. I have a very hyperactive mouse. Here we go. So again, good afternoon. Um, we are here to speak about the benefits of a regional boards of cooperative education. Um, as outlined in House Education Committee um, H630. So what I'd like to talk about is um, what we would plan on talking about today is our current representative, representative challenges in the student programming. Um, Andy's gonna speak in terms of Wyndham Northeast and his issues. I'm going to speak about the positive impact of collaboratives on student outcomes and my experiences through Hartford Area Regional Collaborative. Then Stephanie will speak to the work that has been done to create the Vermont Learning Collaborative, what our um, our history, our vision, our needs and accomplishments and the challenges are, and then overall what we see as the benefit of H632 district. So first I'd like to turn over the slides to Andy and I will move them forward, Andy, as you progress. Keep going. Andy, you're on mute. It's the third time today. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to speak. So, uh, Andy Haas, I'm uh, the super, uh, superintendent for Wyndham Northeast Supervisory Union. And um, my hope here is to just give you a snapshot, kind of like one district, um, what we're struggling with and, and where we see the benefits of uh, a regional collaborative. So within Wyndham Northeast Supervisory Union, um, we service the towns of Rockingham, Westminster, Athens, and Grafton. Um, and so we've got just over a thousand kids in our pre-K through 12. And um, one of the things when we've looked at the data, we have two thirds of our students are on some type of intervention plan. So 28% of our students are on IEPs or individualized education plans. Um, about 19% are on 504 plans and about 19% are on an, an educational support team plan. Um, so um, trying to do some interventions with those kids. Um, we have lost almost close to a half a million dollars due to the census block grant in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. This coming year for FY25, we're going to lose $350,000 in special education funding. Mm -hmm. So we have extremely high needs and we are having a reduction in our, our uh, costs that we can um, provide for those. We currently have five unfilled special education teaching positions. And 
we're filling those with teachers that we are contracting with who are not necessarily Vermont teachers. Um, they do get Vermont certification, but we're, we're going out through agencies to do placement where we're talking sometimes up to $15,000 if we want to buy the contract out. So we're not even getting teachers that are working directly for us all the time. Um, and then we're spending, we have a high cost just to um, try, if we like a teacher to bring them into our system. Um, I have seven unfilled paraprofessional uh, positions and I have two unfilled relative service positions. Um, and this has been going on um, since last year and flowing into this year. So, um, Sherry, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the other things that we have um, really noticed in the last few years, and, it, and it's really, I think, um, COVID did not help the whole situation, is we've had a mission creep. So within uh, Wyndham Northeast, uh, we have six school-based clinicians. Those are people who provide mental health services directly to our students uh, that we've brought into our local budgets. In the past, we used to uh, contract with HCRS uh, through uh, Success Beyond Six, um, and HCRS has uh, uh, slowly over the last six years that I've been with RSU um, have been unable to fill those positions uh, uh, with uh, quality people or people who are staying year to year. And so we've had to uh, bring people on so that we got quality people that can provide for our students. But at the same time, uh, the needs of our students post COVID have led us to the point that um, we've got someone in every single one of our buildings. Um, uh, we actually have two people at our high school. Uh, that's the level of need for um, the uh, the mental health. Uh, we've also brought on social emotional coaches, um, and so we have them at our high school and at our um, at our middle school. And so uh, we're unfortunately not going to be able to continue to provide that service um, after uh, ESSER because that's been ESSER funded. Um, but those are individuals that are working with twelve students at each building on a six week week rotation basis. Um, but the needs are that high. Um, Act 264 or the coordinated service plan uh, meetings. Um, again, over the last six years, I've seen the decrease in the services that are provided through HCRS um, and other outside agencies. And the onus is being put more and more on the school systems to provide those services. In fact, I was invited by a family to just yesterday participated in Act 264. Um, and I, the outcome of the, the meeting was, okay, what is the school going to continue to do? Let's add this service on for this student. Let's add, uh, can the school provide after school programming for this kid? Can the school provide, um, change the IEP so that um, there's a paraprofessional now, as opposed to in the past, there was again, coordinated services coming together to support a student holistically, it's now all on the school to provide services for kids. Um, home to school supports. I have three home to school liaisons um, that provide support for families um, to try and uh, engage uh, our families to get kids back in school. We're talking high truancy kids, but also uh, those students who uh, and families who um, they don't trust the schools as much, but our home to school folks, we do, uh, we, we transport families to medical appointments. We transport families uh, to get their driver's license. Um, if a family needs clothing, uh, I've got a basement full of clothes. I'm sure many of our schools do. I have schools full of racks of clothes for kids um, that, we're constantly trying it, you know, uh, we have families that are asking for things all the time and these homeschool liaisons are running all over the place. How do we get food to kids and families? Um, uh, additional administration, uh, we've had to bring on uh, uh, added administrators within our buildings. Um, 
Again, our high school has only got uh, 300, a little over 300 kids. We have three administrators right now in that building because the needs are that high. Um, we've, we've been able to use some grant funding to provide some of that. Um, but the, and then we did the same thing in the high school and, or the middle school, pardon me. And again, the same level of need of kids uh, to try and keep kids from getting suspended. We're trying to do uh, diversion and um, things to keep them out. Um, again, reconnect in planning rooms, uh, the idea that um, kids are getting sent out of the classroom. How are we able to uh, re-engage those students and get them back into the classroom so they're spending less time out of the classroom? Um, and then restorative practice coaches. Um, we have uh, invested heavily using our ESSER funds in this area, um, but putting a lot of social emotional practices in place where in the past, that wasn't the mission of schools uh, to provide all of these things. It was really to, uh, you know, provide that academic support. So, um, and we can go to the next slide, Sherry. Oops, it is not moving forward. There we go. There we go. So what are our stressors? Um, as I kind of mentioned, uh, finding qualified staff to fill open positions, not just the body. Mm -hmm. I think one of the hardest things is, you know, we, we might get a couple of people to apply for a position, but how do I how do I justify putting someone who really doesn't have the qualifications in front of a student, especially those with high needs, right? I need highly qualified people. Um, I have a lack of quality out of district placements. Right now, there are waiting lists at every single facility. Um, and what's happening is if we need to look at a student who maybe needs that as a therapeutic intervention in their life right now, we don't have somewhere to go, so they're staying in the schools. So if you go back to that mission creep, the idea is we've had to bring on all that extra support and where we might have been able to uh, intervene with a student, but we have to keep them in the buildings now. And that's a double-edged sword uh, because I don't want students to go out of district, but at the same time, there is a time where that is needed. Uh, lack of transportation. We have our own transportation department, um, but... We've got kids, I have kids that are traveling all the way up to the Hartford and beyond area. Uh, I have kids that drive down, you know, are going down to Brattleboro. I have one student who's going over to New Hampshire. Uh, so there's a, a, a large need regionally transportation uh, to move kids around. Um, specialized programming for students that are not in special education. Again, 28% special ed kids on IEPs we're looking to stem that. And one of the things that we are really struggling in is how do we build programs for students who are not identified? Um, because the, the, uh, the only option that a lot of people see is, oh, we get them identified, then we can get services for those students. So building those, um, those specialized programs. Uh, lack of quality nearby professional development. Um, it, you know, a lot of stuff does get presented up in uh, the Mount Pillar, Burlington area. Um, and that's a long way for our folks to travel. And added to that is we don't have any subs. So every time that we're sending folks out for PD, um, we, um, we're getting that double knock. And, and really the idea of having the ability to have professional development in the area uh, would be a great, need, uh, a great reliever for us. Um, Again, funds to help develop systems of in-house programming for student for all of our students. I kind of covered that a little bit. Uh, increasing costs to support special ed students. Um, again, a huge stressor for us in our district. Um, mentioned the decreasing funding for special education. I'll mention it again. We're losing three hundred fifty thousand dollars next year. Um, the lack of space to create specialized programs for all students. I think. Uh, as we look, at, we talk regionally, you know, um, the need to have some creative spaces where, where kids can go um, is really important. And then the lack of support um, or access to partner agencies. And, and I already mentioned that, so I won't um, go into that. Um, and then on a little bit of a positive note, if we can go to the next slide, uh, Sherry, um, the reliefs that we have seen and to speak directly um, to the point of talking here is with partnering with the collaborative, the Vermont Learning Collaborative, 
we've been able to recruit a qualified special educator who's come on board. Uh, the onboarding fee was a lot less than um, the fee that if we went with a, another agency. Um, and the person we got is someone who lives in Vermont, someone who's close by, already part of our community. They, it just wasn't, in, you know, they weren't looking in that area. And um, Kim and her team were able to um, get them to us and we were able to bring them on. And we're, we've been very pleased with that person coming on. Regionalized professional development. The collaborative has really um, started to uh, bring the idea of what can they bring to us regionally so that we can begin to um, start having that professional development where folks are um, staying in the area. Same thing with job alike cohorts. Um, it brings professionals together for us. Um, and in talking with my staff, they appreciate the fact that they can have conversations with their colleagues that are regional, that they're not talking with people that are far away. Um, and because we all have very similar needs and, um, and discussions um, to develop programming at our high school. So uh, we've really begun to look at that, that piece that I was talking about, which is um, specialized programming and how we might be able to um, utilize Vermont Learning Collaborative and their expertise and helping to develop those programs, but not just for uh, Bellows Falls Union High School, but then how can we help support um, our, our colleagues in other districts where we might start bringing some of those students that they can't find placements for, that we can bring into our system and um, we can help uh, support those kids uh, with the whole idea of getting them back to the school. So those have been some of the big reliefs we've had um, just recently and the collaborative's been up really only this year. So it, it has been a piece uh, for us. That's all I, I really have. And uh, Sherry, I'll turn it back over to you, so. Thank you, Andy. So I'd like to um, contrast Andy's experience with ours at Mountain View Supervisory Union. So we have been members of the Hartford Area Regional Collaborative for as long as I've been in the district, which is over 30 years. I wanna note that while uh, 10 years ago, we were at about 17% students as identified for special education services, we currently, through the programs we've de developed, reduced that number to about 12%, and even that is post-COVID. So the Hartford Area Regional Collaborative includes their own district programs, which we're able to access. They have a regional alternative program, of about 19 students, and those are all students with emotional disabilities. They have the Hartford Regional Autism Program, and again, those students with autism whose needs are such that they cannot participate in a gen general education setting. And then they have a regional resource center of 14 students, which are students with intellectual disabilities who have, may have a more community-based program. In addition, They've been able to provide us with consultation to member schools, including uh, applied behavioral analysis, consultation and assessment, wraparound community-based planning, as Andy noted, those Act 264 uh, community-based meetings, those are challenging to bring all the agencies together. And if you're a small district, we're uh, just over a thousand, having access to those resources, knowing what the resources are, knowing who those contact people are, those are critical in order to get the right wraparound program for any of our students. Um, functional behavioral assessment observations at a home school. So having an expert come in, observing a student within their building, speaking with a student, speaking with the teachers to customize a program for success is in a really important consultation for schools. And Hartford has also provided some really um, needed professional development and graduate post coursework. Years ago, they came in and did life space crisis intervention. And that was not just with special educators, but also with um, general education teachers developed their skills in addressing students' behaviors in the classroom. So Hartford Area Regional Collaborative includes all these districts, Hartford, Springfield, Lebanon, New Hampshire, Mascoma from New Hampshire, Dresden, Rivendell, Orange Southwest, Orange East, Mountain Views, which is ours, Wyndham, Northeast Windsor, Northeast, and White River Valley Supervisory Union. What this means is, and the collaboratives were put into place 
in reflecting on this back in the 1980s, uh, early 90s. This was a program that was offered across, collaboratives were offered across the entire state of Vermont. It was my understanding that they were really uh, encouraged by the Agency of Education and they provided a high level of support to develop those collaboratives. Over the years, those supports from Agency of Education have not been as available and how to develop the structure has been incredibly challenging and something that we've experienced. I think that Hartford Area Regional Collaborative is one of the few collaboratives statewide that is left. So benefits of being part of a collaborative for us at Mountain Views, it provided us models for addressing needs of students with intensive needs within the school community. Not only did we, were we able to go visit their programs, they provided us with mentorship, structures, ideas, consultation on how to set up those programs within our building. They provided consultation with experts on creating effective programs, um, whether it was their director of the Wilder School or assistant director who came over and trained our people on how to set these programs up. We were able to meet students' needs closest to the home school. And we have learned, and, and my experience as an educator for over 40 years, the closer the intervention is to the home school, the highest likelihood that the student returns to that school and is able to graduate from that school. Really important. We want to maintain those relationships. We want to cultivate those relationships. We want that student to want to come back to who they um, left. And it significantly reduced the number of out-of-district special education placement, placements, therefore reducing budgets. Currently at Mountain Views, just over a thousand, we have two students in residential and only one student in an alternative day program. That's remarkable. The programs that we were able to develop as a result of um, collaborating with Hartford is a program we call Options. It's for students with challenging behaviors who did not experience success in a full school day program in the high school. Uh, we reduced the number of students withdrawing from school and we, the program built on student successes. So for example, um, our options program is at the rec center in town in Woodstock. It is a, a program that students come and go to. They, we have a bus that runs every hour on the hour. Students participate in the same curriculum they would be receiving at the high school. So as we reintegrate, as we bring students back, we're able to bring them back into the classroom. Their on-campus teachers grade their assignments. Um, are their teacher record on their transcript? And it's a program that students choose to be part of. It is an option. So if a student isn't um, having success in the regular setting. We use this for grades seven through 12. They have the option to go off campus, work for a period of their school day and return to those classes they feel most successful in. And that's a conversation with the student. It's very unique and it's not just special ed. This is considered a general ed program. And in terms of the 20 students who participate, I would say half are regular ed, gen ed students and half are special education students. We have a program at the elementary school called the PALS program. And it, this is, meets the need of elementary students with communication needs and intellectual disabilities. They may be on the spectrum. They may have an intellectual disability. They need more skill development in order to be set, successfully integrate into their gen ed classes. Um, and they're able to move through the hallway, be in activities, be in recess, really be part of their community. And the students, their peers are their peer group. We also have a program at the high school called Community Classroom, which all meets the needs of middle and high school students with the communication needs and intellectual challenges. And again, provides a real, real peer social group. These guys get together on the weekends, they enjoy each other, and they move throughout our building. They come over to my office and they're having engaged in conversations. So very community-based, community very success-based. And as a result of being part of the collaborative, we had the model and support to develop such programs. I'd like to transition now to Stephanie, who has been a critical member in setting up the Vermont Learning Collaborative. Thanks, Sherry. Um, so I am the current board president of the Vermont Learning Collaborative, and I'm the director of student services for Wyndham Central Supervisory Union. And um, I think probably everybody in Vermont is pretty famous for um, outside of the box thinking and removing barriers and trying to, you know, figure out what to do. 
Um, the slide right before this that says all of our students are all of our students, I think is key to what we're all trying to um, achieve here. And even though we have very similar numbers for each of our supervisor unions, um, and we have similar needs, we have mountains in between. And I know all of you, I mean, that's probably why the room isn't uh, as full as it was this morning, because of the weather and the travel. So, um, so I just want to kind of like, you know, make sure that that's uh, understood and why we really started um, working toward this Vermont Learning Collaborative opportunity or, or embrace it. So the Vermont Learning Collaborative is um, an interesting nonprofit that had been running for, I think, like 14 to 16 years um, prior to us taking it over. And they, I think, actually, sorry, Sherry, I think, yeah, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. So, all right, so we'll go to yes, yeah, perfect. So the the we have eight supervisor unions and school districts who are members of the the um, collaborative right now, and we basically like if you were to draw a line from Woodstock down, that's that's all of us pretty much. Um, it's uh, Wyndham uh, or Mountain View Sherry Supervisor Union, uh, Windsor Southeast, um, Springfield and the River Valley Tech Center, Wyndham Northeast, Wyndham Southeast, Wyndham Central, and Wyndham Southwest. So it's um many of us. So these are the representatives on the, the board. And um, so you can, thank you, Sherry, you can go. Yep. So our history, as I was saying, uh, so they've been in operation since 2014. And about six years ago, um, Lyle Holiday and Zach McLaughlin were um, invited to be members of the Vermont Learning Collaborative Board. Um, and their intention overall was to start shifting toward regional thinking and organizing themselves regionally. And um, it kind of didn't really, you know, and it didn't really go anywhere, I think, probably because being a superintendent is hard enough and <laughs> adding more is rough. Um, so Zach then shared information about the SEAM Collaborative in Massachusetts and um, had arranged for some tours for several of us regionally to go down and take a look and see how they um, offered, you know, various programming and uh, opportunities for students regionally. Um, Sherry uh, then initiated discussion with the regional superintendent group. Um, then the regional superintendent group um, started talking more about regional programming for specialized programs. Um, at that point, the the director, the, the board of directors of the collaborative were getting ready to retire and reapproach the superintendents um, with the offering of the nonprofit that was you know well established, as well as the uh, liquid assets they had. And, and it was kind of like this really awesome, like dangling option for them. Uh, but they, it, you know, we knew that it would be a lot to kind of take over. So the, the um, superintendents engaged directors of student services and special ed, directors of curriculum and instruction and other members. And we all decided to just, you know, start jumping in and make this happen. Um, so Zach and I joined the board and started the transition, and then we talked everybody else into uh, joining, which they were happy to join, I have to say. Um, and so each supervisor union or school district who wanted to kind of launch us um, provided some seed money that was based on like a rough formula um, based on ADM. And then um, over time, we've just shifted to, you know, which supervisor union wanted which members um, on the board. We have a board of 11 folks now, and we have um, we contracted with New Solutions K-12, which um, is Nate Levinson's um, company, and worked with them to hire our executive director, who's Kim Oliveira, who you'll hear from uh, in the question and answer session. And um, we also have a part-time administrative assistant and uh, some other contracted employees um, who we then contract out with supervised unions to um, meet the needs. Um, Thank you, Sherry. You're great at that. Um, so our vision is uh, with these eight supervised unions and districts um, is to provide regional, effective and efficient support and solutions for challenges. And those are including but not limited to, as Andy and Sherry have said, like hard to fill positions, um, placement and coordination or, or support for placing students um, in already established um, district run um, programs developing and managing school-based collaborative run programs for high need, low incidence disabilities, uh, professional development, and lots more. We are, um, you know, we are branching out as supervising and their school districts let us know um, different needs that they have. You can go ahead, Sherry. Um, one of the studies we did was around um, identification of the supervising and school district needs. 
So these are the, the kind of top bullet points, but um, so, and I know you guys can read through them all, just kind of briefly run through. Um, so specialized programs for social, emotional, behavioral needs, that's a huge one for everybody. Uh, Andy touched on that as well. Re-engagement programming for grades five through 12. So students who are either, you know, hospitalized or they are, they, you know, have high levels of anxiety and aren't able to come to school or um, any of those kinds of situations, um, really helping them. Um, and, and any students who are at risk of um, dropout. Um, alternative high school programming for students to connect for academics and vocational training. And this is supplemental, not in place of the career technical education centers and other kinds of things that's you know huge for you guys to know. It's, it's, we're not trying to be uh, competitive. Um, transportation support, as Andy said, um, it's a huge challenge for all of us and the transportation has its own rules and regulations around it. Um, grant funding for regional initiatives, so being able to act as a fiscal agent or seek grants that maybe school districts or supervised unions can't do as um, and, as public entities, but as, as a private nonprofit, we can. Um, and then the cooperative purchasing is an area that we can definitely, um, you know, work on. There's paper, school supplies, transportation, fuel, athletic equipment, and um, and really, like, ultimately, I would say we're really trying to um, support out of collaboration or coordination so that nobody's duplicating efforts and we're able to achieve like the highest level of um, discounts and those kinds of things. So, all right. Um, so our accomplishments so far, are we've, ha we've provided several professional development um, opportunities and uh, as a region um, for the special education rules and regulation changes, um, statutes around independent schools, things like that. Um, recruitment and placement of hard to fill positions. And um, we are working more toward this job alike group. So um, trying to create equitable um, connections with all of our, um, our all of our providers so that if you have a, a speech and language pathologist in your supervised union, they could work with other, uh, other SUs or SDs to be able to make sure that there's alignment or, you know, um, uh, the correct kind of professional development that um, is more aligned regionally instead of really like national level kind of stuff um, and supporting each other on that and um, really working on consistencies. Um, we developed an assessment team to provide evaluations for supervising unions and school districts. So we have um, a group of folks who are available to be deployed at any point to conduct evaluations. Um, consultation for different kinds of trainings, um, the needs assessment and program development. Um, we secured a school safety consultant who could work with districts. Um, you guys know those kinds of needs pop up, <laughs> it seems randomly. Um, and then online modules for an annual mandated uh, staff training and then mentoring and coaching and different consultation to school district leaders. Um, so those are, you know, like Andy said, you know, we just kind of took over in the last couple of years. So these are really the um, the big, you know, items that we've accomplished so far, but we have a lot more that we want to do. Some of the challenges we've found is um, it requires flexibility and thinking and that commitment to utilizing collaborative services instead of the already established um, entities we've um, worked with or resources. Um, geography, as I mentioned when I started, uh, it's a very vast area um, to service. So there's a lot of uh, parts to you know kind of figure out around there. Lack of facility space options. So um, we're working really hard to find space in schools um, because we know that the least restrictive environment is within our schools, as Andy was talking about too. Um, funding sources and um, that's, you know, it's not everything can be grant funded um, and everybody is, you know, tight with money right now. <laughs> like we're all having a hard time with our um, budget. So we're working really hard to be very efficient um, and then competing with well-established specialty agencies. Um, and so we're, you know, that we're, but we're trying to be supplemental, but there are some already established places um, that may not necessarily be the least restrictive setting for students, but it's hard once students are out um, to then, you know, bring them back into another type of program. So we're, we really kind of need to build it while students are outplaced and then bring them back. And you guys know that would be a both and kind of situation and amidst uh, fiscal cliffs and funding challenges that can be tough. So um, 
So that's kind of where we're at. Um, I would say like a lot of the work we're trying to do is more on this like conductor kind of level and orchestration to um, maximize efficiencies um, overall and expand offerings for students and, um, you know, work with all the agencies, all the schools to really um, create some fantastic options for students. Um, so I think that's it. Sherry, you on the next one? I Yes. And so I think what we really want to communicate, again, you've heard perspectives from three, three different supervisory unions, again, very similar in lots of ways in terms of our challenges. Why we really want to support 8630 is that it offers other districts the infrastructure to develop a regional board. What Stephanie didn't share was all the challenges in terms of hiring a position, insurance, benefits, all those structures, Hartford Collaborative is able to hire the director of the collaborative, pay their benefits, have a whole infrastructure built in. Because we went the direction we went, we are setting that up as we go. What I've read through H60 is that all that structure is in place. You're not having to figure it out or build the plane as you're flying it. Um, and that's how we've often felt with the work that we've done. Um, Again, it addresses many of the financial challenges faced in forming VTLC. It supports using current available space, space within districts for program development. There are buildings that have extra space. You know, we talk about that reduction in student population. It's created spaces in buildings. Let's use them. We use our rec center that has an open year, uh, room during the school year to be our, our community-based program. It's very efficient that way. And mostly it encourages creative collaboration, maximizing efficiency, reducing costs, and expanding offering to students. That's what we're experiencing. When we talk, we talk as districts who want to work together, and we see H630 as really supporting that collaboration. So we just want to open up, close the presentation. At the end is a slide that has our contact information, but we'd really like to be available to any questions you have um, based on the information we shared. And again, Kim is here. She has vast experience from Massachusetts. We were very lucky and to, and to, and to bring her across the border. Um, and so we'd love to hear any questions you have for us this afternoon. Oh, am I still running? Yeah, you're you're right. <laughs> Representative Conlon. Thank you. Uh, and, and thanks for this. It, it, it seems like you're well ahead of the game here. Um, you know, one of the things, one of the small technical things we have to do in this bill is draw lines. Um, we were looking at county lines or designated agency lines. They're roughly the same, except in the Northeast Kingdom. And is that sort of a, a, a good way to go? So we, um, we are, uh, Andy and I are members of the Southeast region for superintendents, and that's where we began. I'm right on the cusp, Windsor Southeast is right on the cusp, but it gives me an opportunity. If I see a program that I see that Vermont Learning Collaborative is producing and providing, I can access that, and then I can access the one at Hartford. So it's given me some flexibility, a little competition there. Um, I think the way it's structured, the way I read H630 in terms of board membership, so I am a member of the Collaborative in Hartford, but I am the vice chair of the board of the um, Vermont Learning Collaborative. Not sure how that would shift with the new legislation. I, I think also like where Wyndham Northeast sits right now, right? We sit between with regional centers. Um, I have students who can go to Springfield and I have students who can go to Brattleboro. And so, you know, we're used to the split uh, of county, you know, counties. We, we cross county lines. I like, you know, I've got a kid that goes all the way up to uh, Hartford. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't want to limit, uh, I mean, there is a limit to how far people can travel and do those things, but um, being able to Hartford, because we're also part of, um, there's still the ODP collaborative at Springfield that operates uh, that, um, Sherry, you can, or Stephanie, you could probably speak to that a little more than I can. Um, and, and so we sometimes access kids that go up there because then they have direct access to uh, the career center up there. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to limit it to county for that reason. Um, I would also encourage like looking at what resources are available for students because ultimately it's not this is not just about budgeting. This is about what student needs are and the families and really helping Vermont be the thriving place we know it can be. 
And so I think that that's a big part of it is, you know, what is available in some of these really tucked away, tiny little rural areas. Um, and so when, you know, when I read through the bill, it really didn't seem like there had to be lines drawn of like, you know, how it has to be, but more an option that if a couple of supervisor unions or a region wanted to come together to do, um, you know, create a collaborative um you know, board that they would have the ability to do that. Um, so I could have read it incorrectly, but um, but I do feel like that freedom and unity is what goes a long way in Vermont. And uh, I know Scott Farr was on prior to this at the testimony, and um, he you know spoke to that too. And and uh, I think that's it's a it's a challenge in Vermont with that. Thank you. I, I guess I'm not sure that those responses gave us. Uh, perhaps the kind of guidance we might be looking for. Um, and I guess we, and we need to take a deeper dive into what are the consequences of drawing lines in certain ways? Does it necessarily prevent you from the broader work you're doing with these other collaboratives? Um, anyway, if you would give it some thought, if you have any further work for us, that, that'd be great. Well, if I could just add, I think, and, and where I see opportunities, or if I want to collaborate with a couple other districts, they might not be attached to me. Maybe it's, I don't know. Like if to have that flexibility, I mean, if there's got to be hard lines drawn that, I guess the way I read it, like there'd be more flexibility in that, um, that if a few wanted to join a collaborative, so I can almost be like a Venn diagram where I've got the ability to, I could be in this collaborative, I could be in that collaborative and 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 have opportunities because resources might, Every everyone in my region may not need the same re resources, but if I can jump into another collaborative somewhere else, that's an opportunity. And and we already do that to some degree with like uh, the work we do um, or the contract we have around our copier service. Right, we're in this larger group. Not necessarily the districts around me are part of that, but I'm part of this bigger purchasing group so that I get my copiers cheaper because I, I might be connected with, you know, someone out of Mount Pillar because they might be in that, that, that purchasing group. So I guess I would just encourage that if there's a flexibility, allow that flexibility. Oh, I, I, my reading of it, it, it wouldn't prevent anything like that. It just more allows districts to form a formal structure with cost sharing, um, you know, joint boards. I think a lot of collaboratives sort of have to be parked in one administrative office for or another, and this sort of allows for um, a joint administrative office. Yeah, and I think um, that's and the and the structure of Hartford. So I am part of Hartford Collaborative, and I have as a special director sat on their board. But my first responsibility is to provide the appropriate services for my students. So while I may give input. I have an agreement for Hartford Collaborative. If I have a student and they can't meet their needs, then I could go to a program in Bellows Falls that is better for that student. So I think there are two different things happening here. You can be part of a collaborative, you can join your communication, you can look at your shared interests, but as a special ed director, I can look to other programs around and we need to include programming. By adding collaboratives, we're adding choice, we're adding district community-based programming, which is the highest level quality we can provide. And I think those are two different things. Um, I was just going to add too that um, there is like difference between member and non-member. So I think that there's like the structural organization of a board and then what, um, you know, if you want to be a member or a non-member, like, you know, there might be different kinds of um, fee skills for that. Or as Sherry said, it might be that like, you are part of this particular collaborative board based on maybe a regional line or you know county line or whatever you know however it's decided but you also have the ability as a you know somebody you know with funds to be able to say i need this thing for my student it happens to be in you know wilmington and i'm going to you know contract with wilmington to provide that and i think that's kind of the the key is that maybe there's only you know one board member board that you can be a member of but you are able to um, branch out for services Representative many did you have a question i did yeah <laughs> um it goes back to the last i think the last slide that sherry suso was reading what h630 offers districts and so when i most of these are new to me 
Uh, I first thought about it in terms of supplies, then obviously services revenue, that makes a lot of sense too. How does the space thing work? How does extra space in one place, how can that be used? How can, how can that be improved with, with this structure? So I'll just give our district as an example. We built a program and because we are so community-based, students in our, for example, options program also participate in high school classes. That's a much different model than going to an alternative program at Wilder. And so what's happened is we built this program, we lease a room at the Woodstock Rec Center, other districts then send their money to us so we can develop, so we can continue to build on the number of uh, programs and the number of size of, of, um, of, of our programs that we offer. So we know that there, for example, at Bellows Falls, Andy has a classroom that's available, there's room there, he starts a program in his school. Stephanie wants to send a student. She pays Andy for access to that space and is able to have enough students in the program to make it uh, financially feasible. And it develops a peer group, which is really critical for these students. Did I answer your question? I wonder. It absolutely does. Yeah, David, thank you. Okay. If I could just add on there. So, um, Years ago, uh, when I came to Wyndham Northeast, I was the uh, director for student services. And we had some programming where our needs of our students were reducing. And so we didn't, um, it was getting to a point where um, I didn't have enough students to fill the programming and started having conversations with other directors on, would you be interested in sending a, a, a student there? the infrastructure was not in place where I see like this regional, like, like we could have, like I ended up closing the programming down because I couldn't justify spending, you know, having one teacher for one kid, right? Like the, it, it just wasn't worthwhile, but the infrastructure was not in place that we could, we could get schools to, you know, be able to pay in and fund and, and be able to support that. Uh, and also our boards understanding that they're not spending all this money for other schools. So I think like having some governance and some structure around it would be beneficial to that. And we could have maintained that programming and kept that teacher uh, who was very qualified. So. Understood. Thank you. Other questions? Representative Buss? Can you talk a little bit? So it, it, um, it's funny. You're like, this provides structure. And we as legislators are sitting here going, what is the structure that we're asking people to join? So, you know, um, how how does that, how do you see that actually working? Like what's, how did you organically come to create these um, collaboratives or cooperatives and and how challenging was the, the paperwork part of, of getting everything together administratively? I'll just say real quick, it was a lot of Zach McLaughlin, um, you know, threatening and, and beating people over the head. And uh, uh, no, it, I'm tongue in cheek. It, it was a considerable amount of work. I, I mean, I, I think that's been the huge challenge, but I, I'll let others speak to it. So. Yeah, I think what it, what it really does outline are all the steps. What's a board? What's a, what are all the rules and expectations? And so we were able to jump on an existing collaborative and use some of that infrastructure. But even then, Port Stephanie has worked so hard to put the other kinds of, so what's a board? What's the membership? What is the structure? How do you, I mean, I reading through that, that is the, the roadmap that so many districts need that we didn't have. And luckily we're buying into an existing, or became part of an existing program. So if you're starting from scratch and we're teachers, like we don't set up structures like this. We're not used to that kind of thinking. It's already in place when we come on board. But when you're creating something new and you have a roadmap that this presents, it's really helpful. And I know a lot, many districts are trying to do this kind of work. And again, they're in the place where we were before. What's the membership? All that language that has to be set up and all the structures that need to be in place before you can hire someone and you can put the programs in place. It's really difficult. We're teachers. I also think um, just tagging along with what you guys are saying is that it's, it is crucial that these are run in a similar kind of fashion because it, sh it shouldn't matter where you live as a kid in Vermont or as a taxpayer in Vermont or an employee in Vermont. There should be 
several similarities. And I think that there, these are the types of structures you're looking for consistency, um, at least in the, in the structural part of it. Um, and just the other side of that is like those challenges that Sherry talked about. I mean, we've had to look at directors and officers insurance. We've had to register as a nonprofit. We've had like so many hours and hours and hours of processes that are like really like I look at it as like volunteer time because it, it can't interfere with, with the work that I'm doing as a director of student services. And um, and then you look at things such as say you have an executive director so, as we do. If my supervisor union were hosting, say that all of this collaborative kind of process and thinking, it would look like my supervisor union's budget was up by a whole nother employee when really it isn't, it's shared across the, you know, the districts and supervisor unions. So it is important to have this kind of um, shift in structure so that it is very clear what's regional and what is our, you know, complete in district or in supervisor union um, cost. And did I hear you say that you uh, divvied that out by long-term weighted ADM? We did, um, and it was, like I said, a very, very rough, I don't know if you guys know um, Bill Anton, but he was the superintendent in Wyndham Central Supervisor Union, and um, he and I think Zach developed this like very rough formula that was kind of like based on ADM and, uh, you know, and it was uh, just for seed money um, to get things rolling along. And then the intention is for these collaboratives to run on their own finances, like that, that long term, whatever you're already paying in out of district placements, or you're already paying in supplies and those kinds of things, all those savings would be, um, you know, the ways that you're funding. Right, it's a fee for service model. So for example, if you send a student to the alternative day program, it might be $60,000. So it, it's, it's much less than the residential, it's much better than having it, um, you know, out of state. Um, and again, as close to home, we reduce you can't even imagine the transportation costs. Transportation costs often cost the same as the tuition to the alternative day program. I, I think the one thing I'll add on there real quick, I'm sorry, is like, um, I just connected with Kim over the safety piece because we have a need you know, in our district and it's like, hey, could you provide this? She's connected me with someone um, and but the way the funding would work, you know, we're paying the collaborative and the collaborative is paying that person. So we're not going directly, which potentially opens up some opportunities with um, certain things our business office needs. If we're paying someone directly and there's a lot of paperwork that gets involved. So there's a cost savings behind the scenes that I don't think I ever would have realized until I became a superintendent, how much <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, oh, that's a great idea. And then it's like, the the man hours so we've already got everything set up already with the collaborative and so you know i can pay them directly if it was something that was within our district already that maybe we were hosting it it that would streamline it even better or if we had that regional um, piece that we already knew um and and then it might potentially be someone who comes in again with safety but helps all of the you know those districts that are part of that collaborative that they could get that need and again as opposed to paying to have someone on staff or a large retainer I, I might only be paying that you know the little bit that I need um one more thing that I want to add um Kim and I well we had a, a Vermont Learning Collaborative board meeting this morning and Kim um indicated that in Massachusetts the like it's almost word for word what is in this bill um how they ended up um pulling together the structure for their collaboratives. And there's various, as you guys have probably studied, like different states have different kinds of ways they run their collaboratives. So I would encourage, you know, some more research to be done on how that's, um, how that has worked for each um, collaborative or state. But um, it's important to have these rules because if, if there, uh, if there isn't consistency, it ends up being so um, legally challenging in lots of different ways. And uh, Kim Kim said Massachusetts had some major uh, pitfalls and mayhem because of not having this kind of structure in place. So I think the bill is very important from a legal standpoint as well. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, any other questions? I have a quick point? question. Yeah, I mean, I'm tired, so I can't like, it, it's just kind of a little, uh, I, I probably have like a hundred questions, but um, I'm just wondering in terms of collective bargaining, like does that enter into it at all or the least restrictive environment? You know, I mean, I, I just wonder how some of those very legal terms and, you know, legal rights uh, play into this. And, you, you know, we probably could have you come back at another time. Yeah, and maybe, gonna, I just uh, I'll assert my authority and say, I think the collective bargaining question could be probably answered pretty succinctly. I think least restrictive environment is a huge discussion. Okay. Yeah. That we may want to put well, off. Well, I think if I can just quickly, uh, LRE, the closer we can come to their gen ed program, right? So if we can build something within a high school, within a community, that is so much closer to then sending them a half an hour away to another school without their peer group. And mm -hmm. the reason we do least restrictive environment is because we know that means we'll have higher success in children's sort of reintegration. So the three programs that I have in my buildings have a higher probability of the student transition out, graduate from the program, and graduate from my high school. So in, in terms of meeting LRE, if it's building-based, if it's community-based, absolutely, it meets that higher standard. Great, thank you. As far as collective bargaining, um, we have run into some of those challenges um, in good and bad ways, right? So uh, for some of our outside related service provider kinds of positions that have been difficult to fill, um, as supervisor unions, we, you know, some are handbook employees, some are working under the teachers union. And so, so there's various, um, I don't know, differences within each supervisor union or school district anyway, which also mm -hmm. dictates, you know, wage and grade, you know, salaries and those kinds of things. And so this, having these types of collaboratives, it, I think it would depend and we would, of course, want to work with the union. So like if there is a situation or a position where, it would typically be um, a, a position under the teachers union, then we would want to make sure that we are, um, you know, working with them to fall under that kind of a contract. On the flip side of it, it, it might allow other flexibility so that we can actually compete with the private market, um, because a lot of, like, say, the related service providers could also be working year round in nursing homes or, you know, hospitals or facilities and have much higher pay. So, those are things that um, I do think collective bargaining would be a, a, a large part of all of this to, to consider. Thank you so much for your time and energy on a Friday afternoon here and giving us, I think, a really strong example of great work that's happening in the field, the creativity around it, um, trying to be efficient with our dollars and provide the best supports for students. So um, we are, I think, as a committee, pretty excited about this being of all the challenges in education, maybe one small way to start meeting some of them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you. We may thank you with follow-up questions, but thank you again for today. Thank you. Drive safely home, everyone. Take care. Thank you.